uh, internet will not let us down this time. Okay, so yes, um, let me start again and uh, introduce these objects to you that I work a lot with. And before I introduce the objects themselves, I'll introduce the finite fields that we'll be working over. Um, so that's what you see here. Uh, FQ will be the finite field of cardinality Q throughout, where Q is a prime power. And working over such fields means that we're working in characteristic P, so that if you add one to itself P times, then you get zero. Um, then two other remarks about uh, these fields for all primes and all uh, are greater than or equal to one, there exists a unique finite field of that cardinality. So there exists a unique f p to the r. And conversely, uh, every finite field um, is uh, an f p to the r for some p and r. So these are really all the finite fields. And a property that we'll use a lot is that uh, any element of a finite field of Q satisfies um, that it's equal to its Qth power. So let me see if I can draw a little square around that. Um, this property we'll use again um, very soon. All right, so this is the kind of field we're working over. And now what are the objects? Uh, first of all, I wanted to introduce the, the simplest case, the one dimensional case, which is uh, an elliptic curve. So hopefully you can now see this slide. Um, this is the full definition, is that it's a genus one um, projective curve that's given by a cubic equation of this form. This is the most general form. Um, so it's a homogeneous, cubic polynomial, as you can see, and the coefficients A, B, C, D, and E here, we'll choose them to live in this finite field FQ. Then um, we also require there to be uh, a designated point O, so the point at infinity, and uh, it turns out that for these curves, the points on them, so the solutions to this equation, uh, form a group, and that is very special, certainly not true for other classes of curves. Um, and so this, the typical picture that you see of this, I've also included here. If you draw a picture of an elliptic curve over R, so the real numbers, then it could look something like this picture here. And then what you would do to add two points A and B is that you draw a very straight line through them as I'll now attempt, very straight. And um, because it's a cubic curve, it will hit the elliptic curve in one more point. And this is not quite the, um, the sum of the two of them, because now we reflect in here, and this point is A plus B. So this is a very geometric construction, um, and again, very unique to elliptic curves. I should say that if there are questions at any point, you should feel free to interrupt. Um, otherwise, I will move on. So um, what can we say about these elliptic curves. We'll be interested in the points on them that live over finite fields themselves. So um, here's the definition. We denote by E of fq to the m um, the points on this elliptic curve. So these are points x, y, z that satisfy the equation. Uh, and these points themselves are defined over fq to the m. Now, um, we can determine such a set, so E, the set of points, um, using the Frobenius, what's called the Frobenius morphism on the curve. And for elliptic curves, it's kind of curves, it's uh, nice to see how this is defined. So let's call this phi. Um, of E of Q to the M. So if you're interested in the points over FQ to the M, then you look at the morphism that sends a point to uh, the point whose coordinates are raised to this Q to the Mth power, Q to the M. And now we recall this property uh, that I circled before, that 
if the point x is defined over fq to the m, then it will satisfy that it's equal to its q to the m's power. So, in other words, um, we can now describe the set of points as the fixed points of the Frobenius. Right, and that is very powerful. Um, it allows for a much stronger analysis than we would have otherwise. Um, so that's what's on the next slide. If we were interested in the fixed points of Frobenius, so the eigenvalues of Frobenius, then it makes sense to look at its characteristic polynomial. And that has a name. So the characteristic polynomial of the Frobenius here over FQ is the, the Vey polynomial. So I've denoted that by P sub phi, where phi was the Frobenius. And for an elliptic curve, it's known that this uh, polynomial is integer coefficients and is of degree two, because um, it's two times the dimension of the variety, so in this case two. And if you factor it over an algebraic closure, then you find these roots alpha and alpha bar, so the complex conjugate. Uh, so the roots come in pairs. That's something we'll see also in higher dimensions. And there's a number of things you can say uh, about these roots and these polynomials. First of all, there's a, a, a Riemann, which unlike the, the classical one, this one is actually proven. And it says that uh, for elliptic curves, it says that the absolute value of this alpha is square root of Q. So if we're working over FQ, then it's square root of Q. There are also the conjectures, also proven, even though they're called conjectures. And um, they predict, among other things, that the number of points over any extension, so fq to the m, uh, is described in terms of this alpha, because it's just what you get when you put t equals 1 in the characteristic polynomial. And so over fq to the m, we'll find alpha to the m and alpha bar to the m. And then this is the number of points for all m greater than or equal to one. And doing a lot of name dropping here, there's a so-called Honda Tate theory, which says that uh, alpha, or if you want the, the Vey polynomial, determines an elliptic curve uh, up to something called isogeny. So up to isogeny. So um, let me write that in a little box here. An isogeny is almost an isomorphism in the sense that it's surjective um, and it has a finite kernel. So kernel finite. So up to this finite kernel, it's an isomorphism. And um, a Vey polynomial cuts out one isogeny class of elliptic curves. So that's also very strong. Um, and then another nice thing, uh, or nice way of seeing the connection between all these things is the, the zeta function that I've written down here. So the zeta function is really, uh, is this, is really the generating function of the numbers of points over various extensions. So you put all of those in an exponential function, and then the magic is that this is actually a rational function. So that's the rational function I've written on the right. Uh, and here, this is like a um, renormalized version of, uh, of P. So it's this one, the numerator. And the denominator uh, you can show is the zeta function of the projective line. So the point of this slide is to say that the Frobenius anamorphism can be understood very well because we uh, can write down its characteristic polynomial and say a whole lot of very powerful things about that polynomial. Oops. Seem to be no questions, so I'm moving on. One other thing, namely, that I wanted to say is that uh, it's an interesting thing to look at the p-torsion of an elliptic curve. So 
What is that? The P torsion over any field. Okay. Those are all the points on the elliptic curve over the field K, such that if you add them to themselves P times, adding in this geometric way that I, I drew for you before, then you get uh, the point at infinity, which plays the role of zero in the addition. So these are all the points that have order P. And for an elliptic curve, then you can distinguish two cases uh, in this definition. So either um, if you look over the algebraic closure of F, FQ, then the P torsion is either isomorphic to Z mod PZ uh, or it's zero. And these are really the only cases that occur. And we call the elliptic curve ordinary if it's in the first case and super singular in the second case. Um, ordinary is called ordinary because it's the generic case. So the super singular ones are much sparser. And um, as I sort of already said, every elliptic curve is either ordinary or super singular. And the connection with the previous slide is that you can read off which of the two it is from the same characteristic polynomial, this Val polynomial. So I can read, I can read this off from the Val polynomial. All right, um, I know I'm throwing a whole lot of definitions at you in a, at a rapid pace, but this is all, uh, these, these are all the concepts that uh, will be important for today. Um, and now I've defined them for these elliptic curves, the one dimensional uh, case. So now let's uh, move. See the slide, it's moving very slowly on my own screen. Oh, okay, there we are. My internet connection is unstable. Um, right, so, and this is the formal definition here, a non-singular projective group variety. And you should think of this as, as you said, a higher dimensional elliptic curve. So in particular, this group aspect uh, is important. The points on an abelian variety, again, form a group. So it's in the same class uh, of things. Now, um, we can write down similarly a zeta function and a Val polynomial. So look at a, an abelian variety of dimension G. Then um, the zeta function again is the exponential, uh, so the generating function of the numbers of points. And in this case, it has a slightly more complicated expression, but it is still a rational function. So it's the product of some polynomials in the numerator and in the denominator. Uh, and even though there are all these extra terms now, it's determined by the polynomial, which is still the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius. So char of uh, the Frobenius. So uh, like in the other case, actually, it's a renormalized version of it. And if you um, go to an algebraic closure, then it will factor into linear factors with these roots alpha i. There are two g of them, so two times the dimension, just like for elliptic curves, and they come in complex conjugate pairs. So Wait, could you... and on top of that, sorry, could you could you explain a bit more what a group variety? What is the what is an abelian variety? Just what is a group variety? Or how should I read this? Well, yeah, thanks. Uh, for now, I just, I just mean that it has the same property as an elliptic curve, meaning that the points on it form a group. So even though for abelian varieties of higher dimension, we often don't have a nice defining equation like for an elliptic curve, uh, or if we do, then they look hideous and really huge, um, but that doesn't matter. We can still make sense of this group structure of the points on them. So there is a geometric way in which to see this. And that's really the, the key property here. 
So other than that, okay. it just means it's a variety, meaning it's cut out by some polynomial equations. We don't really know what they are and we don't really want to know either. Does that answer your question enough? Yes, yes, it answers it. Thanks. Um, okay, yes, so then, what did I want to say? That the Riemann hypothesis still holds, meaning that all these alphas have absolute value square root Q. We also have the Ray conjectures and Honda Tate theory as well. So this characteristic polynomial or the alpha i, the set of the alpha i determines a up to isogeny, which was something a bit rougher than an isomorphism. Okay, so this all looks very similar, which neatly. Um, and finally, now, and now my notes are going to go away, but you can also uh, make sense of ordinary and super singular for these higher dimensional varieties. So it's ordinary um, if its P torsion is really big. <laughs> so it's actually as big as possible. G was the dimension of the variety. Um, and it's super singular if it's sort of as small as possible. Um, so then in that case here, I mean that A is isogenous, so almost I, isomorphic. I can't see product. the bottom of Sorry? your screen. I cannot see the bottom. Oh. I don't know what I can do. Uh, so I've written here that A is ordinary if the P torsion has cardinality P to the G and super singular if it's isogenous to a power of a super singular elliptic curve. And I'll try to write above um, this. I don't think I'm, my, all my slides are this full. Uh, so I'll write here maybe. Um, and you can again, read this off from the Ray polynomial. Um, but if the dimension is higher, then there are also other options. You don't have to be either ordinary or super singular. There are things in between, um, but I won't talk about that today. Um, so that's really, that's really the picture. Everything that I told you before goes through more or less the same. It just becomes slightly more complicated. Then to make sort of, you know, either or less complicated, I wanted to talk a little bit about one special case of abelian varieties, which is a Jacobian variety. So those come from uh, when you work with smooth curves. An elliptic curve is also a curve and it's actually isomorphic to its own Jacobian. But if you look at a curve of higher genus, elliptic curves have genus one, but if you look at a curve of genus G, then there's a corresponding uh, abelian variety, which is the Jacobian. And it has a geometrical uh, definition that I'm not going to say here. Uh, I'm just going to tell you it exists. And why is this useful? Because then we can study the curve through its Jacobian and vice versa. So if you look at the zeta function of the curve here, so this is the zeta function of the curve, it's the generating function of the number of points on this curve, then it again has this very nice expression. Now there's again only one polynomial in the numerator, and this is still the zeta function of the projective line. Um, and we can study this through the Frobenius morphism on the Jacobian, because the curve itself doesn't have a Frobenius as such, but the, the Jacobian has one, and we can study that Ley polynomial, phi phi here, which is again a normalized version of the polynomial that we saw here. And so it's also again a product of uh, linear factors over an algebraic closure with where these alpha i satisfy, satisfy everything I said on the previous slide. So this provides a nice way of um, going back and forth between the two objects and learning something about one by studying the other. Um, so this will come up later. And that's why I wanted to uh, at least introduce the notion quickly. Um, but like I said, I won't say much more about the details. Um, right, so I think that's all I wanted to say for sort of a background 
or an intro to, to abelian varieties. And I mean, you could give whole lecture courses about these objects because there's so much to say about them. Um, but I thought it would be fun to give a few examples of abelian varieties in action. <laughs> so this is the plan for the rest of the talk. Uh, it's a big slide, but it's really mostly here so that I don't forget to mention all my co-authors. Uh, so the point of the slide is um, I've done various things related to abelian varieties. You can later ask me for details about any of these. You can also find all of these papers on my website or elsewhere. But my plan for now is to uh, go over each of these things and sort of try to explain to you what the question is that we're asking um, and what sort of tools you would use to answer them. Okay. Um, right, so there we go. The first one uh, was called mass formulae for super singular abelian threefolds. And um, the question really is, as I wrote it down here, so fix a V polynomial, which we now know means fix an isogeny class of abelian varieties. So this notion is a bit rougher than isomorphism classes. So in particular, each isogeny class contains a number of isomorphism classes. And we are interested in how many, <laughs> how many isomorphism classes are there? So we want to count the abelian varieties, but really the isomorphism classes of abelian varieties in this isogeny class. So with this they polynomial, um, weighted by their symmetries. Um, and I've put automorphism in brackets. So what do I mean with this really, this weighted thing? That is the following, that if you compute the mass of any set, S, then you count the elements of it, but sort of weighted with one over the size of their automorphism groups. So it's like saying if something has three symmetries, then we don't count it three times because it's really the same object all along. So that's the kind of thing that we uh, we're interested in. And one sort of first note maybe is that listing isogeny classes is easy right because listing isogeny classes is like listing these Weyl polynomials and if you fix a dimension you can just write down all the possible polynomials that satisfy the criteria for being a Weyl polynomial and then you know for each uh, polynomial, there will be an isogeny class. That's exactly what Honda Tate tells us. Um, but counting isomorphism classes is very hard and open in general. Classes is hard. Uh, in this case, we focused on the super singular type. So I showed you the ordinary and the super singular ones. We did it for super singular here, but counting isomorphism classes is hard always for ordinary super singular or anything. Um, so one uh, example for, oops, uh, in dimension one, if you look at super singular elliptic curves, so the set of all of these, then during proved that the mass, so the sum over one over the automorphism groups of each of these super singular elliptic curves is P minus one over 24. Oh, oh sorry, so J, we're working over FP bar in this case, the algebraic closure of FP. So in other words, there is a very nice formula uh, available for dimension one. Dimension two was also worked out. Um, so that's why in this pro in this project we did the threefolds, which became substantially more complicated than the one and two dimensional case. And the main ingredients that we used um, were the following. So on the one hand, we used that the theory of the geometry of the moduli space. So this theory is due to um, transport and Li together. And to do our computations, uh, we used Judane modules and 
I'm not going to tell you what those are, but it really turns the problem into not quite linear algebra, but, but semi-linear algebra. <clears throat> In any case, it's something that is much more doable. So let me say a bit more just about that. Next slide. Um, right, so I introduced the supersingular abelian varieties to you before, and we're looking at three folds. So in this case, um, such a thing is isogenous. That's what this squiggle here means. To uh, E cubed, where E is a supersingular elliptic curve. Turns out it doesn't matter which supersingular elliptic curve you choose. If you work over FP bar, then it's all the same. And now, uh, uh, this is so. This is one isogeny class, right? It's the isogeny class of E cubed. And within that isogeny class, there is a, a special element, and that's called the super special abelian variety. And that one is actually isomorphic to E cubed. So you can say that E cubed is like the, yeah. A distinguished element in its own isogeny class. Okay, doesn't sound super deep, but it's really useful for us. So let me just write that this is an isogeny class, and here this is a distinguished isomorphism class. Isomorphism class. And why is this such a useful one? It's because the masses of these are known. Right? We're interested in the, the masses for all super singular things, but we know the masses for super special things. So then really it boils down to finding for each super singular variety, a meaningful comparison with the super special case. So, that is the following thing for each super singular abelian variety. There exists a minimal isogeny um, from the super special thing. So this is A. There exists a minimal isogeny from A0 to A. And the precise description of this depends on uh, explicit parameters. And finding these minimal isogenies, we heavily exploited uh, the knowing how the moduli space looks. So that allowed us to find these minimal isogenies. And then... Um, if I can ask, what is, what is minimal? Is that the kernel is least, most least finite or...? Sort of. It just means that any other isogeny from a super special thing to your A factors through this one. Ah, okay. So it's really sort of the most direct way in which to go from the super special thing to your super singular thing. Thanks for the question. Um, and then the idea that we used is that you can compare these two masses, knowing the, the minimal isogeny with a comparison factor that is really uh, an index of automorphism groups. So here we have, I'm going to write the full thing so that it's not wrong, but you should just read this as some uh, index of two of symmetry groups. So we compare these for the two varieties and that allows us to compare the masses. And these indices, we compute using the theory of Judelet modules. So in and a nutshell, then, the, yes. May I ask you a question? Could you please remind us what the mass of an abelian variety is? You just said something before about what the mass of a set is. What are you actually summing over here? And what are the uh, automorphisms yes. you are quotienting by? Um, sorry, what are the what? What are the weights? Ah, so you mean what are the automorphisms? Because um, well, I, I thought you were you were counting isomorphism classes, but here you are taking the mass of one abelian variety. What is that? Yes. So I was hoping to kind of gloss over this because it's a bit technical. <laughs> but <laughs> thanks for asking. So no, really, what we're doing is uh, when you compute this mass, then you um, that's the set 
of set of um, isomorphism classes of super singular abelian varieties with the same p divisible group group as a so in other words uh, this is not down for a little bit um, but you fix an a and you look at uh, all the isomorphism classes of varieties that have the same p divisible group and you sum over those and you weight them by their automorphisms so then this mass is a quantity that we can relate to the mass of a super special one so that mass is similarly defined through this comparison thank you thanks for asking <laughs> Yeah, I know I'm sort of staying very vague with all of these things, uh, but I hope that uh, is sufficiently clear. Okay. So the, the upshot is that you can count uh, using geometry and using semi-linear algebra, um, roughly how many abelian varieties there are. Okay, then um, I wanted to move on to the next uh, project. Slide is moving very slowly on my screen. Um, and this is a project uh, that is in progress, but about to be finished. And it's asking, um, well, as the title says, how we can describe and compute polarizations of varieties. Now, what are those? A polarization is a map from A to its dual variety. So every building variety has a dual and a polarization is a certain map from A to its dual. Again, I'm not going to give you the full technical um, definition, but these maps are very interesting because they give a lot of extra structure to your space of abelian varieties. And in particular, uh, Jacobian varieties are always, always have nice polarizations, um, but in general, we don't know for a given abelian variety what sort of polarizations it has. That depends very heavily on the geometry. And so the question was then, if you pick uh, an abelian variety, or rather, if you pick an isogeny class, so a Vey polynomial as before, is there a way in which we can describe the polarizations of the varieties in this class? And not only describe them in a way that we, that we can write down, but also in a way that a computer can then spit them out. <laughs> that you tell it what the variety, what the Vey polynomial is, and it tells you what these polarizations are. Um, and I should say that a nice description uh, of polarizations is available already in characteristic zero. So if, say, we work with abelian varieties over the complex numbers or over the p-adic numbers or another field of characteristic zero, then there is a very nice a computable condition that gives you polarizations. But we are working with abelian varieties over finite fields, so we cannot immediately use this uh, description. But that's why one of the first ingredients is um, lifting abelian varieties to character characteristic zero. But I should note immediately that uh, this cannot always be done. So you cannot lift any abelian variety to characteristic zero. And it's um, sort of an open problem to determine exactly which varieties allow a lift. But sometimes it exists and then we can use it. And the second ingredient is that is the following. And this looks maybe a, a bit vague, but what it means is that there is a way in which to translate this notion of um, a polarization, which is sort of a geometrical thing, right? it's a map, but we can translate it into an algebraic thing, namely, uh, I keep switching, namely an ideal in some algebra that comes from the endomorphisms of the variety. Okay. So the main question is, how do we think about these polarizations in characteristic P? And I'm going to sketch the idea to you uh, by means of a picture. So it's going to be very colorful in the end. And Hello, Dan, can uh, I ask a question, please? Yes. Uh, the previous slide, this is Franz Hurt, 
you said oh. in abelian varieties cannot always be lived in two characteristic zero. Uh, yes, that is again a vague statement that I should make more precise. But I mean, so we know that up to isogeny and up to extension of the finite field, you can always do it. Ah, yeah, okay. But we we don't we want something a bit stronger than that. We don't want to allow field extensions, and we don't want to initially. We don't want to allow isogenies. No, but I guess you can do it over any field. Sorry. I I think you can lift any abelian variety from any characteristic p field to characteristic zero. That's well, as so, far as you know the theorem. Yes, we want a canonical lift. So we want all the endomorphisms to lift as well. Ah, okay. And that is again something that I didn't want to say, uh, but it's a very good point to raise. So we want a specific type of lift uh, for uh -huh. our purposes. So the statement was uh, that you want to lift it with all the uh, and, and endomorphisms. Correct, yes. And then I agree with you. Okay, thank you for your answer. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yes, I realize that the experts might be thinking all the time that I'm um, that I'm forgetting to say a lot of things, but uh, I'm trying to sketch a picture here, so apologies for that. Um, right, so then to make sense of this picture here, I wanted to say that since a polarization is a certain map from A to its dual, we know that polarizations are contained in this set of homomorphisms from A to its dual. And these sets we can understand uh, in various ways. So suppose that A0, this one here, is um, a variety which can be lifted. So this is a variety that lives in characteristic P and uh, it has a nice lift with all of its endomorphisms to characteristic zero. So this AK here is the lift of A0. Then um, if the lift has these properties that I sort of briefly refer to that all its endomorphisms lift, then um, this gives us a way of seeing the homes of the homomorphisms both upstairs and downstairs. And now, as I said, there's a nice link uh, in characteristic zero, a nice description of polarizations. Um, so that's why you want to go up here. And this set here, we can view, um, so here, this here is an equivalence sort of with fractional ideals. So there is a way of associating with this set um, the following fractional ideal. So you don't have to worry about what this is. It's an algebraic object. So green means we can go from homomorphisms in characteristic zero to an algebraic object. We can also do that in characteristic P. Uh, so that is, or let me choose a slightly different color, maybe. Um, that's what this here says. So also in characteristic P, there is an equivalence with fractional ideal. And these equivalence sort of equivalences sort of talk to each other in a way that they're almost the same. Um, but there could be this element alpha here that uh, messes things up. So we can identify these up to multiplication with an element alpha. Okay. But in any case, this square here, because we have such a nice description of polarizations in here through the square that I've just made here, we can understand polarizations also for A0. Um, and initially I said, we want to find polarizations for abelian varieties in uh, any isogeny class. And so that's what the left part of this picture is doing, this one here. That says that if you have an isogeny from A0 to B0, isogeny, then you can use this isogeny uh, here to find similar sets of homomorphisms and similar algebraic objects. So in other words, if done 
Okay. Then you're done for the whole class because you can move it around. Um, oh, well, there's a long delay. Um, but then you can move it around through the class. So in other words, so it's enough to do the work once uh, for each isogeny class. Okay. Um, if it started to get really colorful but confusing for you, the upshot is just that we can understand these polarizations um, if we can draw a nice diagram like this and use the characteristic zero description that we knew uh, already existed. All right. Um, let me move on then. So we've talked about counting abelian varieties up to automorphisms and um, finding polarizations. Here's a different kind of question. Uh, and that's about these Jacobian varieties that I mentioned earlier. And the question is as follows. If you have an isogeny class, uh, then we know it contains a number of isomorphism classes. We don't know how many, but when uh, does it contain a Jacobian variety? And in particular, when does it include the Jacobian variety of a hyperelliptic curve? So a hyperelliptic curve is the definition. That's a curve with a map to the projective line of degree two. So you should think of this as uh, here we have P1 and here we have a hyperelliptic curve in a sort of degree two, but there might be um, ramification points. Uh, and I should mention that in general, it's an open question that people study a lot uh, is to, oops, to determine which, which isogeny classes contain Jacobians in general. Classes contain Jacobians. So I said Jacobians were a special case. Um, when do these special cases occur? That's really the main question and we answered it for this um, special case where our curve is hyperelliptic. And what we did is we, uh, I have to go back to this one, is we used these, the structure of these ramification points. So uh, this here, this here is a ramification point. Means that the cover is sort of degenerate at that point. That happens finitely many times. And we can study the Frobenius action on those points. And then we can find a way to write down that action uh, in terms of the Weil polynomial modulo two. So let me say a bit more about what I mean on the next slide. If the main question is clear, so we're wondering if you fix a Weil polynomial, when is there a Jacobian over hyperelliptic curve in that class? So let's. Uh, write down a bit more details. So a hyperelliptic curve is of the form, it has an equation of the form y squared equals f of x, where the degree of f is either 2g plus 1 or 2g plus 2. I'm going to write this for simplicity. If the genus of c is g. Okay. Main point is that this is a nice kind of equation. Uh, so if you have this picture in mind again, then the, what are the ramification points? So that's where the, the two to one map to the projective line has only one solution. So that has to correspond to points of this form, alpha zero, um, where alpha is a root of f. Then we see that sort of um, y squared equals zero has only one square root. So in other words, there are no, not two separate solutions anymore, but just one. Uh, so this set is called the set of wire stress points. These are the ramification points of the cover. And um, sort of over the algebraic closure, there are 2G 
plus two of those because the degree of our function is 2g plus two. So there are 2g plus two roots counted with multiplicities. Um, and the point is that these points are permuted by Frobenius. So there's an action of Frobenius on this set and the orbits of the action uh, form a partition of 2g plus 2. And now without going into any of the details again, I'm sorry, this the partition that you find, you can prove determines the Weil polynomial, so P of phi of the Jacobian of C modulo two. So you have these special points, there's a finite number of them and they are permuted by Frobenius and exactly how they are permuted gives you the Weil polynomial modulo two. It's not so strange that we don't find the whole Weil polynomial because we only have very limited information here, but we find it modulo two. And then studying the possible partitions that can occur, we were able to prove the following theorem, um, which is that if you work over finite fields of odd cardinality, so P cannot be two because we're already working modulo two and things get very messy if you, if you do this mod two, then if you have a Weil polynomial, uh, here's a Weil polynomial for a genus three curve. So this is a degree six thing. So it corresponds to a curve of genus three. Let me add that of genus three. Then if its coefficients uh, satisfy these very simple congruence conditions, modulo two, then the corresponding class does not contain a Jacobian. So that was very surprising actually that this very, really very simple analysis provides new restrictions on whole isogeny classes containing Jacobians. And you can do this analysis in any dimension. I've written down the sort of the first interesting case for you here, but this really works in any dimension. So again, we study the geometry of these curves and we learn something um, through the Weil polynomials. Right. Um, I know it's already five to six. I guess there were some hiccups, but I can stop any time. Just stop me when you when you want me to. Otherwise, uh, I want to tell tell you about some more things. Um, a completely different question here is the following one: which abelian varieties? But let me add curves or abelian varieties over finite fields have a maximal or minimal number of points. This is a question that is inspired by uh, cryptography, where you know, for cryptographic applications, uh, things become safer or less safe depending on the number of points that such a thing has. So that was the original motivation, even though sort of the project itself is quite far from cryptography. Um, but why do we speak about a maximum and a minimum in the first place? Well, that follows immediately from this theory of the, the zeta functions that I showed you before is that there exists a Hasse bound on the number of points. Let's do this for curves. So if you have a curve over FQ, then its number of points minus Q plus one, the absolute value of that is less than or equal to two G, G is the genus of the curve times the square root Q. So this is a both a lower and an upper bound for the number of points. Um, if we recall that the number of points is um, this product of one minus alpha i, then we see that um, this maximal and minimal behavior can be translated directly into a statement about the alpha i, namely it's maximal if and only if all of these alpha i um, are minus root q. So I've written this down as follows. 
then you get as many points as possible and minimal if and only if this number is one for all i. And now in this notion of maximality and minimality, we can define it similarly for um, abelian varieties and make sense of it that way. Okay, so we're wondering then when this happens, when you have a maximal or minimal number of points. And here the two main ingredients are the following. First, there's a link between this maximal minimal behavior on the one hand and being super singular on the other hand. And this is a little bit more subtle than I've written it down here. Uh, so really, I should say that if you're maximal or minimal, then you are super singular. And conversely, if you're super singular, then you are minimal. Okay. How you can okay. be maximal and minimal at the same time? Oh, you cannot. I, <laughs> with this line, I just meant that there, there is a connection between being maximal or minimal and super or singular. Minimal. So I guess it should be as or, yes. <laughs> But in fact, uh, the two are sort of related, and I'll, I'll say a bit about that on the next slide. Um, and that has to do with the second point, is that to study this question, we, we looked at the Vey numbers under field extensions and also under what happens when you, when you twist the variety. Um, so let me go on to that now. If you know that, oops, uh, let me do this. If you have a curve here, over fq, which is maximal, then you know that over fq squared, it's minimal. This is what the theory of the Vey conjectures tells us. And it's not just true for uh, fq squared, but for all even extensions. Um, and on the other hand, if you look at over all if you look at all odd extensions, then it remains maximal. So in particular, if you have something here, which becomes minimal over some extension, which has to be even degree, then it can happen that halfway there, it's maximal. That doesn't have to happen but it can happen, it can happen. And so we were interested in exactly when this happens. And by the, the previous slide, it's enough to look at super singular cases. So when a super singular curve, meaning it's, it's Jacobian is super singular, first becomes maximal, and let me be very brief about the twisting thing. So this is twisting um, and say that if you have a twist of a curve, that means that it's something that's um, after a field extension becomes isomorphic to it, but maybe over the field itself, it's not. So if over FQ bar, they are isomorphic then twisting affects the Frobenius. So C and C prime uh, don't have to have the same Frobenius morphism over FQ. And therefore it also influences this minimal and maximal behavior. And so we were wondering how many twists of a certain curve have this maximal minimal behavior? What can we say about that? And um, we did some analyses in, in any dimension using what we know about which Bay polynomials occur, what the automorphism groups are, and that sort of thing. But here I've just summarized the one dimensional uh, statement. So for elliptic curves again, if we look at a super singular elliptic curve, then we know it becomes minimal over some extension. We also know from general theory that such a curve is either defined over FP. Um, or over fp squared. So it has a ground field, which is either fp or fp squared, and that really determines the difference in behavior. 
namely if it's defined over fp in this case then uh, the curve and all of its fp twists have this behavior that i mentioned here so they first become maximal before they become minimal uh, and on the other hand if your curve is defined over fp squared then um, it has one at least one twist over this field which uh, doesn't have this behavior which becomes minimal only so this is another question that you can study using uh, the tools that I introduced at the beginning, lay polynomials and the roots of them, um, to answer questions inspired by crypto. And I don't know if I should still say the last thing. Uh, it will be just a couple of minutes. Should I go on or should I stop? I mean, I think you can keep going until 10 past even, right? Because we start like we had all these problems. So. I guess so. I don't want to keep people from dinner, but <laughs> I do like this last thing. So let me let me mention it anyway. Thanks, Alvaro. Um, right, this is a very different question again, and uh, it actually starts by looking at an abelian variety, not over a finite field, but over Q, the rational numbers. And then the statement is that if you fix such an abelian variety and you fix a prime number, L, then um, you can look at the torsion points, so the L torsion points on this abelian variety, and there's a Galois action on these things. So there's a Galois group that acts on these torsion points. And this gives you uh, what's called a Galois representation. So it's a representation row that depends on A and it depends on L. And it's a map from the absolute Galois group of Q, so the Galois group of Q bar over Q, into, well, because of properties of abelian varieties, we know it lands in some symplectic group. So there's a pairing here on abelian varieties that I didn't mention, um, but that forces at least some symmetries. Um, so it forces your representation to land in a symplectic group. And it's a symplectic group of dimension, dimension 2G if your abelian variety has dimension G. So this, this Galois group here is a very mysterious object. And uh, there are many, many ways in which people try to study it. Um, it's obviously a, a very large group, and we can hope to study it through these finite quotients or through these Galois representations. So our question uh, in this project was, when is this uh, representation that you can write down surjective? So when do we find the whole symplectic group as its image? And this is sort of related to, uh, you may have heard about the inverse scalar problem that asks um, which groups, which finite groups occur as scalar groups. So if we can find abelian varieties and primes such that the representation is surjective, then um, this will solve an instance of the inverse Galois problem. Namely, we have then shown that these symplectic groups occur as Galois groups. Right, so that was the motivation for the, for the project. And um, again, two useful ingredients is that this group, the general symplectic group uh, is very well understood. So in particular, we know how to generate it. <laughs> um, we know it's generators and um, we used a lot of combinatorics, actually, of uh, irreducible components of a curve. Won't go much into that, but the general idea is very easy to sketch, and I thought a nice note to, to end on. So we're trying to construct abelian varieties uh, with surjective color representations, and we do the following. So we start actually down here, step one. Um, by constructing curves over finite fields. So we're back over finite fields. Um, construct CP, which is a curve over FP. And okay, this is sort of unfortunate notation because Q is now not a power of P, it's just a different prime number. Um, but L was also already taken. Anyway, I hope it's not too confusing. So we have an CQ over FQ um, such that their symmetries, and I'm going to be a bit vague here again as well, their symmetries yield generators. Oh, 
of the general symplectic group. So in particular, we ask for the um, combinatorics of these components to be such that in one case, we obtain what's called a transvection. And so it's such that the other case um, together gives us then the second, the other generators needed for the symplectic groups, symplectic group. And then um, once we have these curves, then we just easily actually construct a curve over Q that reduces to these curves. So if you look at this curve modulo P or modulo Q, then you find the curves that we have already defined. So this is uh, congruent to CP or P. It reduces to CP and it reduces to CQ. Right, now, by the way, we've set things up. Um, we know then that the, uh, the Galois group that you get for this thing will be the full symplectic group if we just take the abelian variety here to be the Jacobian of this curve. It then inherits the symmetries from both CP and CQ. And that is already enough to ensure that the corresponding Galois group, so the corresponding Galois representation gives us the full symplectic group. Um, so that's how you can also work with abelian varieties and curves over finite fields in such a way that you can tell something interesting about things over rational numbers. Uh, and now it's almost time past, so I should really stop. But thank you very much for listening. Um, yeah, that's it.